You've described this sort of intervention as a race to the bottom. Why are you not convinced by the strategy? Uh, well, historically, the Bank of Japan, actually, it's the finance minister via the <coughs> Bank of Japan, has been a bit half assed uh, when it comes to uh, intervention and to any sort of monetary policy. So your problem here is that if it continues to be so lacklustre in its response, I mean, it's been fairly big, but the problem here you've got is that the uh, firepower and the other side of the world is likely to be an awful lot bigger, which is where you're getting this whole question about QE3, not just with um, the US, but with um, uh, the, the UK and the Swiss and just about everyone else, right? Yeah. So that's, that's why it's a kind of race to the bottom. Yeah. In other words, your problem is that Japan is doing it in isolation. If everyone else does the same thing, Yes, it has to be, to, to be effective, it has to be what they did in the aftermath of the G7 meeting, which is for it to be coordinated intervention, yeah. and not just a, a one-off effort, but actually something that's ongoing. Yes, it's, but, but and here's, here's your problem, because you're running out of options elsewhere in the world. So if you look at what's happening in, in the US, growth is slowing alarmingly quickly, uh, and there will be more talk of QE3. Well, if the Fed does what it did last time, then the, the, the Bank of Japan would have to be that much more aggressive uh, yeah. in, in order to have any effect. And by the way... Uh, what they're really worried about is mm. not so much the dollar and other, those currencies, it's the renminbi, which of course is tied to the dollar. Yeah. So Japan exports more to China than it does to the US. That's, that's, so that's the big one. Richard, just to go through some of your views on this, because I know uh, that you don't like uh, basic materials, do you, right now? You don't like, uh, you think that growth in emerging markets is going to slow, so presumably that means demand for commodities will drop off. Is that how you see this playing out? Yeah, pretty much. Um, I mean, your problem with the, the sort of iron ores, the, 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 you know, the industrial yeah. metals type complex, yeah. is that really it's a punt on China and the rest of the emerging world, and particularly it's a punt on China. Uh, I mean, if you look at the numbers, China accounted for um, about 43% last year of total demand for industrial commodities. That's an astonishing number. So basically, in order to be continued to be bullish on, mm. uh, on those sorts of uh, metals, those sorts of industrial commodities, you have to believe that China's going to carry on up in the ante. Yeah. Um, because, of course, that's the demand pipe part of it. You've also got the supply side of it. So your problem in China, as in quite a lot of other uh, emerging countries, just look at Brazil, just look at Turkey, just look at uh, India, is that inflation, core inflation, uh, is too high, and they're having to slam on the brakes uh, in order to prevent it. So, and, but, that's, but, and, yeah. that's, and that's not just, by the way, that's not just that the, the, you know, the sort of price of rice and mung beans and all that sort of jazz. Mm. It's also to do with housing. So if you get a downturn in the housing market and a downturn in the, in the Chinese economy, you're not talking about recession. They've got tools there, but if it comes in lower than expected, you will continue to see uh, the price of industrial commodities fall. Yeah. Um, you know, mine has been completely trashed in the last yeah. uh, week or so. On Unilever, you say that it's a safe, you say it's a safe investment, boring, but attractive. Look, at times like this, what you really want to be invested, if you want to be in equities at all, question mark, right? So if you want to be in equities, uh, then you want to buy really dull stuff. Stuff yeah. that people have to go and buy, like shampoo and deodorant and antiperspirant yeah. and toothpaste and you know, dull stuff, right? Yeah. Um, because they're going to have to carry on buying them. And that's the point, isn't it? That uh, other businesses might suffer in these tough conditions, but actually people need the basics. So the retailers like Unilever are doing pretty well. Yeah, they do, they do, they do fine. You know, and, and, and the point here is that you, 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 with a cyclical downturn, you're not going to be too uh, badly uh, affected. And look, uh, the point here is that, that they might be dull companies. Mm. It's one of the reasons why craft is splitting itself, I expect. Um, not because it's dull, but because that's the only way to generate some excitement. Um, but the whole point here is that actually, as an equity investor, that's mm. the sort of thing that you want to, to own if the fears about global growth are really uh, becoming crucifyingly uh, loud. So, you know, that's, that's one of the reasons why those share prices have done well, because you're seeing a, a shift out into more, out of more cyclical stocks uh, into these more non-cyclical um, uh, shares. I mean, the interesting thing uh, about Kraft, you mentioned it there, spinning off it, its North American grocery business, wants to focus on the snack food business, specifically in emerging markets. I mean, I, I suppose that's a, a sort of a growth strategy many companies are, are pursuing right now. And with these retailers, it's no different. Emerging markets, place to be. Long term, absolutely right. Short term, different question. Why is that? Well, because long term, that's absolutely where the global economy is going to go. Um, so we know that the emerging world is going to be the source of growth, um, partly because that's, mm. there's too much debt that you're yeah. paying off in the developed world, right? So the growth prospects of the developed world are appalling. So every man and his dog 
uh, is going to be going to the emerging world. Now, it's absolutely right. Longer term, mm. shorter term, your problem is that you're going to get, uh, I suspect, quite a strong cyclical slowdown. So those strategies are not going to necessarily look too clever in the short term. I know that you don't own any financials in Europe or the US. No. No. Why Zilch. is that? Um, because we got all, all of them at the end of February. Um, and uh, for a number of reasons. One, of course, is that toxic tango in Europe mm. uh, between governments and banks. In other words, if you own a whole lot of government debt and the worth of that government debt goes down, then as a bank you're not looking too clever. Uh, the second reason is just slowing growth. Um, and the third reason are the, you know, the great problems about regulation. So uh, you're, you're, as a regulator, you want to make the banks safer. Yeah. And making the bank safer generally means that your uh, sustainable ROE is going to go down because your leverage goes down. So uh, we got out of everything. Uh, we think that there's a, a lot of systemic risk. Now, I thought that was quite ballsy uh, in February. But, of course, the problem there is that, uh, of course, if you go the world over, it's unclear that you want to own any financials anywhere okay. at the moment. So, so you don't make a distinction between the bigger banks with the stronger balance sheets or the smaller, more vulnerable, vulnerable banks or the Nordic banks and you know, other Western European banks? <laughs> All of them. And I'm Mr. Macro anyway, yeah. so I don't do sort of individual companies. But from a risk-reward perspective, um, we just thought that it just wasn't worthwhile. There were much better things you could do. You could go and buy credit yeah. um, rather than equities. And actually, what the regulators are doing are great for creditors. So, and that played into two things for us. One of the things was uh, we like long-term bonds, sure. hugely, okay. rather un un consensus. But the other thing, of course, is that if you're, as a, as, a, uh, as a regulator, making banks safer, that's great for creditors. If we just look at the day that it's been, I mean, quite a bit of turmoil on the markets, a lot of volatility, but what was the biggest driver of trade today? I think the biggest driver or the biggest disturbance has been the European Central Bank. I mean, yesterday the view from the city was, you know, they're not going to do anything with shock and awe, don't expect too much, but everybody was preparing to cover their positions. I mean, I think what they came out today and said was a fairly substantial statement in terms of let's get involved in the bond market. It's not a question of carry through. The, the, it's the dissension in the ranks, the lack of a unanimous decision. You're I think it's a bit of both. I mean, one of the problems here is that you've got a, a, a central bank that has said specifically mm -hmm. That it doesn't really want to get involved in buying any more of this peripheral r rubbish, right? Right. Now, uh, but we're in new times. I mean, yeah, 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 yeah. I understand that. But even if it did want to do that, right? We've got Wiedemann at the Bundesbank and the Germans in particular saying we don't want this being turned into a transfer union. They are in effect, if they use the EFSF for buying uh, Italian and Spanish bonds, you open that Pandora's box. So the only way you solve this crisis mm -hmm. is if you get a consensus within the uh, German polity and the voting, uh, uh, you know, the, the voters of Germany, mm. that actually that's what they need to do. But so, Richard, I mean, I'm just curious, after the emergency summit that we saw at the end of the July, uh, you, so you don't think that, that's, that there, there's any indication there that we could be heading oh, towards greater policy? you would need something policy. three or four times bigger than that to have any You mean in terms of enlarging the FSF? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Listen, the whole summit was a, a bunch of smoke and mirrors. It was a disaster. They, they came uh, on to agreement on it, a second oh, bailout for Greece. For God's sake. It was not about Greece. It was about... It had already metastasized to the other countries, and it was all about Italy and Spain. They just don't ha have enough firepower. They don't, even if they did have enough firepower. Do you think they, they actually, un well, okay, if we take that as, as, as the posture position, do you think they actually really understand what markets are pushing them towards? Uh, because uh, markets are pushing the, the bond yields ever higher. They're pushing against, they're really pushing against the ECB. Do well, there's a slightly existential question here. Whether they understand it is different from whether they show any signs of understanding it. And politicians and bureaucrats have been dragged kicking and screaming from one crisis to the, end, to, the, to the next, and simply their actions have always been too little and too late. OK, so then, with all this in mind, Richard, a great deal going on, what are you advising clients to do right now? Put on your tin hats, uh, is what we've been saying for the so last few months. So you're going to months. cash? No, 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 no. We've been bu big, big buyers of the asset classes that everyone hated early in this year. We were hugely overweight government bonds in US and core Europe. We've had no peripherals at all since April of last year. Right. We've been hugely overweight, long duration, right? Not just nominally, but long duration, government and corporate credit, investment grade. We talked a bit about um, yeah. financials earlier. Uh, they have shot the lights out. Long duration corporate debt in the US this year has been up 10.5%. That looks pretty good now, doesn't it? 